Hello, everyone. Welcome to the recorded session of our fifth Power Grid model meetup. In this video, we are very excited to share with you the highlights from our recent gathering. Uh, also, uh, as an assistant professor at uh, this university, Eindhoven University of Technology, and the chair of this open source project. And today, we're going to have a meetup, which means we gather together. We share the use cases of the, the, our open source project, and also we try to brainstorm what we want to the next step. And we hope that all of you can have a good takeaway today, and of course, have very nice networking. So the agenda today, based on the time zone of UTC plus two, we already have the coffee. I see everybody is satisfied about the coffee. And then I'm now working with the opening. Afterwards, we are going to hear a welcome address from Professor Kung Kok from our uh, university about intelligent energy system research at TU Eindhoven and the role of uh, system simulation. And the second presentation before the break is from Irina Dukovska, energy data expert from Aleander. And it's more, we are going to talk more about network calculations for enhanced capacity management and the distribution networks. After the break, there will be another presentation from our guest from Anaxis, uh, talking about optimizing reactive power flow in the medium voltage networks. And afterwards, we will have uh, our fun part, which is a uh, highlight of this quarter. Oh, I see, actually, I see a typo here. That should be actually Q1, Q2, 2024. <laughs> uh, good bug fight. And then we are have some community announcement, have brainstorm together to see how we should move forward about this project. And that will be led by my colleague, Peter Salaming. And after the closing, uh, for the people who are physical here, we will have also nice uh, drinks and snacks uh, to do some finish off networking and so forth. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody, uh, warm welcome here at the campus of the um, uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, have you all here in this, uh, in this workshop. Um, interesting one. Um, I see a number of familiar faces, uh, also people uh, from, our, uh, from our group itself. So that's also good for um, uh, networking and contacts. Um, <coughs> and um, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to a very uh, interesting uh, program. Um, I'm gonna um, uh, tell a little bit about uh, our research in uh, intelligent energy systems and uh, also highlight one of the key topics for which we see modeling simulation as an important uh, tool uh, for, the, for the future and also related to the, to the distribution grids. Um, and of course, that's only one uh, one example. Uh, and before of that, before that, I want to give a little bit more insight in uh, the type of research that we are doing. Um, so we are um, in the not in the building of electrical energy systems, but uh, we are uh, uh, from electric ele uh, sorry from electrical energy systems hosting this. Um, that group is uh, around 110, 120 people, and that's including uh, part-timers uh, like, uh, like Tony is, uh, who is uh, in industry uh, or at another uh, research uh, institute <coughs> and working one day a week in our group and participating and cooperating with us in, uh, in, uh, in projects. Uh, that's really important, so, so we keep uh, a, a good connection with, um, um, with, the, with the practice. And we have this arrangement with, uh, with uh, people from uh, the three uh, larger DSOs, uh, you know the names, uh, but also from, uh, from Tenet, uh, and also, for instance, an institute like CWI, uh, the Center of uh, Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam, uh, we also have uh, a part-time uh, full professor uh, from that group uh, one day a week in our group uh, for, uh, for cooperation. He is on campus today, but he was invited to give a speech in some other workshop, and otherwise he would uh, undoubtedly uh, have been here. Um, and of course, I'm going to tell some things that you already know, uh, like um, 
that electricity grids are really in the center of, uh, of attention uh, nowadays. Um, I think we have all seen this uh, cover of The Economist, uh, Hug Pylons, Not Trees. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, see if you can find it online or if you can get a back uh, uh, issue. It had a, a, a nice uh, issue with a number of articles about explaining how important electricity grids are for our economy, but also for, uh, for uh, the energy transition. Um, and then, of course, uh, we know, uh, we know the, 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 the headlines. Uh, there's no green future for Europe without an upgraded power grid. Um, this is the Financial Times uh, saying that uh, it's also now high up on the agenda in, uh, in, in Europe that we need uh, to invest more in our grids. Uh, of course, in the US, uh, there is also uh, the similar problems. Uh, this is about uh, Biden's infrastructure plan. And then, of course, we also have uh, just the local news, uh, which already, and this is one from 2021 or so, um, where... I think every week uh, the electricity grid is, uh, is in the news. Um, so what are we doing about it in um, uh, our group, electrical energy systems? Um, so we like to work on uh, transforming the electricity grids towards a future-proof sustainable energy supply. And then, of course, you have these things that I think uh, I'm preaching uh, for, uh, for my, my own uh, church. Um, um, things that are uh, happening and are important is a decentralization, electrification. We need uh, uh, evolution, revolution in markets, and uh, digitization is an important thing uh, as well. Um, what are we doing um, in our research uh, about it? Um, our research is basically split in, in two halves. One is more looking into the software side, and one is other is more looking into the hardware side. So that's the, 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 the general division. Um, and in intelligence energy systems, the part that I try to oversee, uh, we have a number of staff members having their own focus. Uh, and this includes uh, digital power and energy systems, AI and power and energy systems, smart planning and operation, electricity markets and power systems optimization, and monitoring and diagnostics of components. Um, on the hardware, there's also relevant stuff like power electronics for, uh, for mid-voltage, um, power quality, uh, EMC, high-voltage uh, technology, and we have also uh, a, uh, a research line on pulsed power, uh, uh, pulse power making plasmas. Basically, we make lightning uh, in a controlled uh, environment and use that for, uh, for a number of, uh, of applications. Um, it fits because of the technology, uh, but there you see uh, completely different application areas, for instance, in, uh, in, in healthcare. Uh, and uh, y using uh, plasmas to make a, virtuali a virtualizer um, in, a, in a decentralized and electrified way. Um, I'm picking, uh, do some cherry picking, um, but if you want to know more about it, drop me an email, then we can, uh, we can discuss further about uh, um, these individual topics. Uh, but first, Let's look at uh, the DigiPath Lab, uh, digitization of power and energy systems. Um, we look at uh, data-driven modeling of power systems, um, uh, monitoring control in the edge of the grid, so uh, w where the grid uh, hits the, uh, the customers, um, dynamics and stability in grids with, uh, with uh, a, a lot of inverter-based uh, connections, both in uh, generation and supply. Um, and uh, we have a, 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 a large group of people uh, working on these uh, topics. Then uh, AI in power and energy systems. This is about uh, self-managing and self-organization in, uh, in energy grids. Uh, it's about uh, modeling, multi-modeling, 
uh, of integrated energy systems um, and w we uh, on purpose say energy systems and not always power systems or electricity systems because although we are electrical engineering uh, department based uh, we are also looking um, in in the connection the connection between uh, power and uh, and gas for instance uh, with uh, hydrolysis or with CHP or uh, between uh, between uh, power and heat um, so other other carriers we also look at the multi energy systems that uh, that are emerging um, and there we have uh, one program uh, we also look at uh, the regulation part uh, where we build a triangle between uh, AI power systems and uh, law and regulation. Uh, we do that in a program called uh, Megamind um, uh, where we have with other uh, universities 10 researchers uh, looking into these, uh, these topics. Then I said, okay, I'm gonna cherry pick three uh, power electronics for the milled voltage level. Uh, it's also uh, an activity which is, uh, which is expanding. Uh, we are building uh, a mid-voltage power electronics lab uh, where we uh, test uh, all kinds of, uh, of applications of power electronics. Um, and uh, here we include uh, dynamic st studies of these uh, systems uh, and also design um, of the automation of these uh, of these power electronics. Um, typical uh, focus points are, for instance, uh, uh, solid state transformers, um, and and uh, there you also hit the digitization. Imagine if you would have a solid state transformer uh, that's not just copper and iron, uh, but it's power electronics that you can steer where in each node of your network you could say, well, I send this amount of power that way and this amount of power that way. Uh, and this is AC and this is AC, but I also have a DC link to a, a, a local start, uh, a charging station, for instance. So these are the topics that we are looking at. Um, and then inevitably we have uh, this picture. Somebody not, not familiar with this? No? Okay. Uh, of course, uh, th this, is, uh, this is a big driver for all of us in the, in, in, in the room, a big driver for innovation, uh, a, a big driver for, um, uh, for developments. Um, and of course, then I think you are aware that um, uh, there's no single cause um, for this, for, uh, for this happening. It's uh, electrification, it's... Uh, um, uh, distributed energy, uh, energy resources uh, ramping up. Uh, it's an increased simultaneously operation for both demand and supply, uh, electric vehicle charging, heat pumps, uh, PV uh, generation, um, and also sometimes networks not uh, prepared for the, the new direction of the, of the flows. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, we, we all know that it went quite fast at some point. Um, a colleague of mine um, had two presentations, one in April 2022 and one in last September. Uh, and then um, uh, he made uh, uh, screenshots with, uh, which, which show uh, a, a, a fast um, development in the, in the capacity problems that we, uh, that we have. So we also need to have uh, fast solutions. Um, there's, also, there's also a pitfall there, because if you find solutions fast, then there's a, there's a chance that you will have a lock-in, uh, and that you don't really think uh, your solution through from, from the beginning to the end. Uh, and I think one thing that we have to keep in mind uh, together, um, whether we whether the things that we are implementing now, if that's still future-proof, if we're still happy with it, if it still will work uh, in, the, in the situation we will have 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, and um, th th there's a big chance of having, uh, having lock-ins. So we need to, uh, at this moment, while we are doing these more problem-oriented innovations, think about what's next, 
um, how will this evolve? Are we still happy with that? Um, and we see some, uh, some, uh, some challenges there as well. Uh, talking about challenges, of course, um, the challenges around these capacity shortages are also multifold. Uh, it's regulation, making things, uh, making things slow, uh, also making that some technical uh, solutions which are already there for 15 years or so uh, are not really uh, implemented uh, for the grid. Um, um, and, and uh, also uh, um, uh, procedure times, uh, grid reinforcement, uh, phase uh, too long uh, lead times. I think you are, you are familiar with these uh, challenges. Uh, human capital is, uh, is important. Uh, for the higher educated uh, human capital, we uh, do our best to uh, provide uh, you with, uh, with highly qualified uh, personnel. Uh, and there are a number of people here in the room that have uh, a master in uh, power systems from, uh, from our university, so that's always good to, uh, to see, but we also strive to step that up in the, in the coming years uh, because uh, it, uh, th th there's a need. Um, what we also see that these uh, congestions happen uh, in all grid levels. It's really tickling down into the into the the, the different uh, levels, the different planes of the of the network. Where we did congestion management ten years ago, virtually only in uh, in the transmission and in the higher part of the distribution. Um, now we also have congestion problems in the in the low voltage networks. Um, and so, um, and these, these distribution networks, they ask for different solutions. I will come back to that later as well. Um, and of course, uh, digitization is a, is, is a challenge or sometimes the lack thereof. Um, also, the visibility of the, of the distribution networks is, uh, is low. Uh, and um, undoubtedly, a number of people in the room are working just to, uh, to increase um, the view on what's happening in the in the in the networks uh, um, uh, around the country. Okay, then uh, as a bridge to what kind of um, um, modeling we need to do, I think I hope it's clear that from these cherries that I picked from our program, um, yeah, you, you you can imagine that we do a lot of modeling, we do a lot of. Uh, um, um, simulations on grids. Uh, we do also have uh, real-time simulation cap uh, capacity. We already have for years an Opel RT where we can do uh, real-time uh, transient-based uh, uh, simulations. Uh, we are upgrading that one. Uh, we also uh, are uh, going to buy an RTDS so that we have two different flavors of doing uh, real-time digital simulations. And these simulators are really focusing on uh, the, the, the transient dynamic behavior of, uh, of, of grids. Uh, and of course, we also, if you look more into the energy management, uh, then you're not interested in the seconds and the, in the, in the microseconds, then you're more interested in the, in the, in the, in the minutes and the, and the, and the hours. Uh, so we have different, uh, different modeling um, tools for that. Um, then, as an as an um, um, as an outlook, is congestion going to be part of the new normal? Most probably, it is, because uh, uh, having saying, well, I have congestion, I need to solve that. Uh, the other side of the coin is, uh, I have a network that is only used to its full utility only in a small amount of time. So there's a lot of uh, network capacity that I'm not using for a large part of the, of the year. If you start optimizing that, uh, that's quite similar to handling congestions um, with, with other means than, uh, than uh, digging in a new cable. Um, so if we look into that, um, what we already see happening um, in the energy transition is that electricity use itself is increasing. We are electrifying um, different, uh, different processes uh, in transport, in heating, in the industry. Um, 
and uh, uh, also electricity use is synchronizing further. This is also a trend that is expected to, uh, to uh, go on. Um, we also see that flexibility, of course, flexibility is not a product, but there are, there are a lot of... Uh, um, um, yeah, flexibility is used as, a, as, a, as an umbrella term for everything which is, uh, which is steerable, uh, w w within a day, uh, on a shorter time, a shorter period, or in a in a in a, in a few hours, um, and we see that is increasingly coming from the distribution networks, where in the past it mainly came from a handful of large uh, power plants uh, that were just uh, ramping up and ramping down to follow uh, demand, um, and we see now. Uh, with the outphasing also of, uh, of uh, larger power plants, but also with the introduction of more uh, renewables, uh, we see that um, the, 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 the need for flexibility is going up. Um, and uh, so aggregators aggregate uh, uh, assets with uh, greenhouse farmers, they aggregate uh, electrical cars, um, uh, if they if they don't directly um, deliver, for instance, a frequency service to tenant, then they can passively look up the the the, the, the current delta signal and the uh, the imbalance price and then react to that. Um, um, and then there is also uh, the, the, uh, your 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 miss forecasts where you have unexpected flows uh, in your uh, in your network. This is something that will not go away. This will, go, this will intensify. Um, um, and that will also mean that as a distribution system operator, it's not uh, a day ahead planning kind of problem. Um, do, I have, do I know today that I have a congestion tomorrow? No, you're gonna have congestions that you do not foresee an hour before and then suddenly it, uh, it, it comes up. So things become much more real time. And one of these questions is, are the mechanisms that we have in place to cope with congestion, are they also real time? Um, a lot of them are, uh, are not. <coughs> um, flexibility need for the short term is increasing. I think that one is also, uh, also clear with, uh, with higher uncertainty in your, in your production. Um, um, uh, this is uh, this is the short term is uh, is going to be more important. You know, take a look at volumes in uh, in a day ahead intraday balancing. Intraday balancing is is increasing over the over the years quite uh, quite consistently. And and le let's say uh, how long do we have an intraday market? Uh, only a few years. Uh, and it's al already coupled within, uh, within Europe because it's, uh, it's so important for the whole system. Um, so we need a new coordination system to, um, on one hand, balance demand and supply in the whole system, which, which the electricity markets are, are doing for us. But if we keep doing redispatch, um, redispatch is basically uh, putting money in a market which already ran assuming a copper plate. Um, if you do that every now and then, it's okay, but if you're gonna do that as business as usual, it's, it's, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Um, and so that's why, that's also the first point on this uh, slide, uh, congestion will be part of the solution, the other side of the coin. Um, so redispatch, if it becomes business as usual, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's quite costly. Um, I know that, uh, that we are now having go packs, uh, an opportunity also for the distribution system operators to, uh, to, to use it. Keep in mind it's a redispatch. You first let a market run and, and le let everything that can produce and consume quite uh, efficiently uh, be, be matched through that market and then you wanna change something that costs money. Why, do, why isn't the network a constraint to the, to the market? Um, so that's part of this new mechanism that we, uh, that we need. Um, and by saying that, you basically say that in the electricity system, the market operations need to merge, need to fuse with the systems operation. 
Um, now markets operation assumes a copper plate and then systems operations needs to, uh, needs to solve it. Um, that needs to be one system, basically. So we need to have something like network aware commodity markets. We need to use network constraints as constraints, twice the same word, um, uh, as constraints to the commodity market outcomes. Um, I already mentioned uh, about these uh, mechanisms lock-in. Um, current op innovations is, uh, is problem-oriented, is pr problem-driven, uh, which is what we need, because the lights need to, be, uh, need, to be, uh, need to stay on. But realize that the things that we are doing now in a hurry are probably not future-proof or are not, we are, not, is, are, are not the best solutions for uh, the longer run. Um, in saying that, we um, use simulations to test um, uh, solutions for these kind of problems. For instance, uh, we have a, a large uh, simulation study, uh, which we are now uh, closing off, uh, done in a, sis in, a, in a project called GoE, uh, also with the network operators. Um, where we tested solutions that have been developed by the system operators uh, to handle congestion, to get flexibility out of the low voltage networks and use that for uh, congestion management. We have tested that in realistic future scenarios um, with um, a large uh, simulation uh, that we are doing and we are also um, um, expanding this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this simulation system. Uh, we are expanding that uh, in order to, uh, to um, uh, be able to cope with larger problems, but also incorporate different actors. I will come back to that later. Um, within, uh, within GoE, we developed together with, uh, with TNO um, um, <coughs> a co-simulation platform uh, that uh, can use parallelization and can use uh, batch processing uh, to do these uh, these kind of, um, um, of of studies. And of course, this is not only grid uh, simulations; it's also simulations of uh, the, the 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 demand and supply and the trade and how people react to uh, or how. Uh, home energy management systems react to uh, dynamic prices or react to uh, uh, di dynamic tariffs. Um, and so in there somewhere is a co-simulation part for a, for, a, for a network. And in this case, we used OpenDSS, which is also an open source one, but we could easily uh, exchange that for, uh, for the power grid model. Um, I will go over this one quite quickly. There will be a uh, report uh, somewhere before the summer, hopefully, where you can, uh, can read uh, our, uh, our conclusions um, to, have a, to g give you a, a, a slight teaser. Uh, some of the directions that are now looked at by the distribution system operator are not robust, for instance, if a lot of aggregators are going to relay um, the balancing price, the real-time balancing price, or the 15 minutes balancing price, uh, to uh, prosumers. Um, and that, that's an example of how things get more uh, closer to real-time, while, for instance, a, a, a bandwidth tariff, uh, you set the limits uh, months ahead, uh, and there's a mismatch there. Um, so it, these, these new tariffs will help um, for the short run, but they will not be the silver bullet for the, for the longer run. That's one of the conclusions that we draw there. Uh, so the road ahead, so we need, and this is something that we, that we develop, we have uh, people in the room also uh, contributing to that. Um, we need an open source simulation environment uh, that can simulate all the processes and actors uh, determining the energy flows. Um, so, uh, and this needs, needs to be an agent-based um, uh, modeling system. Um, we need to incorporate the network, connected devices, and the trade processes. So the network, 
the stuff and the people um, into one system, so it needs to be a co-simulation uh, system, a, a system that can uh, simulate a home energy management system or a, an electrical car charging or a large building or an aggregator um, 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 doing a doing trade or a, a distribution system operator doing uh, congestion management. So it needs to be co-simulation and it needs to include the full system. Um, but I think you realize how different the um, distribution system is from the transmission system and how different the low voltage networks are from the mid voltage networks. Um, and wh what, we, what, we, what you see is that mechanisms that work for the transmission, they are pushed down. Can we use the same kind of mechanisms for the uh, for the distribution systems, but the distribution systems are completely different. Uh, you know, the, volt the low voltage networks, the length in the, in, in the Netherlands goes five times around the Earth, uh, while the um, transmission uh, system goes like w w half time or so around the world. So it's a completely different, uh, different ball game and where tenants can have a large control room uh, where they have an eye on each congestion uh, happening uh, in the distribution, this needs to be hands off uh, and just uh, and just run. So that's one of the one of the um, um, the challenges. Um, okay, that's the end of my uh, of my talk. Uh, so uh, please keep hugging those pylons, um, and then hopefully everything will uh, will be okay and the lights will uh, will stay on. Thank you, Kun, for the nice uh, inspiration, inspiring presentation. So, any questions? Hi, Kun. Thanks yeah. for the presentation. Um, Yin Sun from Shell, but also uh, with the group. So, uh, well, hugging the pylon is great, but notice that is the electro to the ground. So, safety point of view, uh, that's... Uh, something to be watched out. Uh, it's nice on the magazine to hug them, but then uh, don't do it on real life because... Uh, <laughs> um, back to the question. So I, I do have a question. Um, you, you are hinting towards the, the kind of human behavior tenets eh, with a kind of go pack market mechanism. You cannot afford it because it's take time to do the market transaction. It's like a stock market. Yeah, it but it's time. also economically inefficient. Yeah, it's not efficient. Yeah. But are you hinting towards that uh, the aggregator to take over the, the BRP, so the balance responsible party? So the, a lot of aggregators start to take the assume the role um, to trade energy to ensure balancing. So basically uh, ensure that the energy produced and consumes are matched, but at the same time have the constraint of the network. And how is this been different from the flow-based market coupling, which is currently being rolled out through the transmission system? Because that's the point of flow-based market coupling. Yes. yes. Yeah, I think there's a s there's a similarity there. Yeah, there's a there's a similarity there. Um, um, I, d I don't I don't think that uh, the you know how you organize BRPs and BSPs and and aggregators. That's that's uh, that's a choice. It is it is the the big question is how do you get the constraints from the physical network into as constraints to the market? You know, a market is an is an optimization algorithm, and you can do uh, constraint based optimization, and that's basically what flow based market coupling is doing. So you find a solution from the market. Uh, to uh, d d that ensures that this market outcome is network feasible. Um, then, of course, if you're going to do that in distribution networks, then you also have to think about fairness and who pays what. Um, but this this is a different layer. Uh, I am as a as a as a consumer. Uh, if I just have a flat tariff for my commodity, for my energy commodity, my energy supplier shields me off uh, of all kinds of uh, r price risk on the on the on the wholesale market. So I don't have the risk, uh, but he also has the profit. So that's a choice. 
But, and but that, that's the point. I, if you look at the difference between the U.S. energy market and the European energy market, what they have is called locational market price. So yes. what they did is actually decompose the time market price of different yeah. time. But it's into still a on the price. on the transmission level. Yeah, on the transmission level. So but we need something similar on the on the distribution level as well. But are you suggesting to still follow the European way of? What it, this is the kind of flow-based market coupling because yeah. that's the European way. Eh? It's a sort of like let the market trade determine the dispatch and then throw it to the to the calculation and then come back to say, okay, these are the boundaries you have exceeded. Yeah. The U.S. way is that I give a price signal for the different region eh? then force the convergence towards the boundary of the physical boundary. Yeah, but I don't think that it, it, it's it's it, it it's in essence. I don't think it's very different. In in the US, they chose to have these prices, different prices on transmission nodes. Yes. And we in Europe, to we chose the whole Netherlands to be one node. But the, but the the, the, the but you're not given the price of that. You, you're given. You're you're not really decompose the price of that node to the detail of the geography. So you're not really differentiating Gelderland and uh, North Brabant, for no, example. No, no. But but yeah, do we differentiate the Netherlands from Belgium, from Germany, from France? So. So, uh, the Netherlands is a node in the in the in the in the U.S. system. We 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 need to uh, talk it over a coffee at some point, <laughs> I guess. Thank you. More questions? I thank you for the presentation. It's uh, really inspiring. Uh, I have maybe a small question on uh, the four slides about one of the research of of your group. So you mentioned that you. One of the topic was to do uh, data-driven modeling of the of the power system. Yes. I wonder if you could give an like simple example, because and also why do we need data-driven modeling of the of the power system? Why do we not rely on the physics-based one, which is more reliable? Yeah, one of the one of the um, one of the of the applications is uh, state estimation. So we don't always measure, or we we measure on more people, on, on more places we don't measure, than uh, than on places where we measure. So you can use uh, AI to um, make soft censoring, for instance, um, <coughs> and then and then there's also in that same track there's research into uh, into federated learning. Uh, how do you uh, quickly trans uh, transpose networks that you have trained on uh, on one place where you have a lot of data? How you transpose it to another place where you don't have a lot of data? And um, uh, also uh, um, neural networks that are also physically uh, inspired, so that has f physical networks in them. Um, um where you tell the network what you know about the physics and what you don't know about the physics, the, ne the, the, the system fills that in uh, themselves. Yeah. Hello, Jonas. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering uh, what your perspective is on how open source collaborations like the PowerGrid model can help in research. Yes, I think uh, the open source it fits very well to uh, to to research, uh, at least in our fields. Um, our dissemination is mainly about um, about making things open. Uh, in the group, we do have a number of uh, of. Uh, um, Technologies that we license off, but that's mainly in the in the, in the hardware. It's a re hardware related. Um, so I think open source fits fits nicely. And sometimes there is the, 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 there is some some lagging because somebody wants to publish first before you make it open. But um, um, no, we we really embrace uh, the open source and open data as well. <coughs> More questions? If not, I have a trick question for you. Oh, a trick <laughs> question. Uh, our other colleague, Professor Hans Lothbeck, uh, I think last week he made a very radical suggestion to doubling the connection tariff for 
of houses for for electrical cars or we uh, 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 solar panels and a heat pump I yeah. uh, I'm curious how you think about it well you invited the wrong uh, <laughs> the wrong professor because <laughs> I also read it um, uh, I think what well also what you get from my story we need to re rethink how we do this uh, and I think that's also the gist of his uh, of his uh, uh, message. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Kung. And You're welcome. Uh, yeah, so great to be here. I, I, uh, at some point I have to leave, but I try to be here for the borrow again. So if people want to yeah. have a chat with me, <laughs> then uh, feel free to approach. Yeah, yeah. thank you for your presentation and uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> so I would like to invite our next presenter, Irena Dukovska. Uh, she's also, uh, he was also one of, oh no, she's still uh, the, 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 the member of the group, at the ES group, and also working as an energy data expert at Alianda. And today she's going to talk about, uh, oh, you're too fast. She's going to talk about our real-time network calculations for enhanced capacity management in distribution networks. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to give a presentation today. Uh, as Tony said, I work four days in Aleander as energy data expert in the Department of System Operations, and one day I work as a researcher at EU Eindhoven in the same group as Tony and Kuhn. Uh, and today I'm going to present to you how we use the power grid model uh, within our company, our department, and more specifically the team where I work in. So, I will start um, yeah, from the introduction about the company and moving on to the department and the product that we're developing grid as a service. And then I will focus on the power grid analyzer, which is a component of the uh, grid as a service, which uses the power grid model, how we use it, why, what are our use cases, the data that, that we use it. I will show one example case uh, and also discuss about some challenges that um, we are busy with and how um, what's the role of the of the power grid model there before concluding my presentation. Um, so um, Aleander is the company uh, where I work. This is our service area. You can see in the center uh, covering six provinces in the Netherlands, both for um, electricity uh, and gas. Um, and uh, since it's a holding company, uh, the department where I work is part of the distribution uh, system operator. And looking into the reality of our service area, similar photo as uh, Kun showed only for uh, the service area of Aleander, you can see that throughout the years, the situation about uh, available capacity both for feeding in or, or um, feeding out from the grid is getting worse, which um, is the reality of all distribution system operators in the Netherlands and it causes us to rethink um, the things, how we operate uh, and plan the networks and also the speed at which we do it. Because as a company we have a mission to provide um, reliable and affordable access to electricity for all our customers. And in order to do that, there we have seven pillars in our strategy, how to, uh, how to change and how to, how, how to improve this, how to make this happen. And one of them is improve the network use and in our department system operations, um, what we do actually in order to achieve this is actually we're trying to act more actively manage the available capacity that we have uh, in Aleander. So basically we try to get better overview of the system, of the current capacity, how it is being used, what is available, what is congested, forecast uh, congestions that are going to happen in the near future and also take actions in order to solve this mostly through using uh, flexibility from the customers. Uh, so all this, all this is done in one process and is done by the product uh, that uh, we call HAS or GRID as a service. Uh, 
And here on the bottom, you can see some screenshots of how of how of how this uh, looks like. What how the uh, interface uh, of this uh, of this has looks. Um, going into a bit more detail, how this is all incorporated into one product. You already saw the human machine interface or some screenshots from it. So we use uh, the topology of the grid, we use different measurements, we use uh, some information about contracts that we have from the customers, and that is our input that we use to get uh, an idea of the situation in the network, both what is the current situation with sta uh, st by doing state estimation and also forecasting what the situation is going to be in the near future. And then based on that, we can determine we can do analysis, see whether there are problems, and then for those problems that are with a solution for with a solution solution fulfillment manager, we can determine okay what is an appropriate uh, action uh, to be taken. And then here we have um, grid agents, uh, grid solution agents, which are more technical solutions that we can do. You can think of curtailment or or things like that. But also we have. Uh, solutions that are uh, related more towards the customers, so either through bilateral or uh, contracts with customers or market-based uh, contracts with customers, and that is actually where we are mostly uh, focusing on and uh, developing uh, further. So, um, uh, so there are two types of uh, products that uh, we have uh, mostly with customers and that are being operated uh, through the HAS. One is uh, the congestion limiting contracts, which is a product that is operated day ahead. So then uh, customers are contacted before the day ahead m uh, market uh, is uh, closed. So then there is no uh, disbalance that is being done there. And the other product is the redispatch uh, contracts, which goes through GoPucks, the platform, the, uh, the national platform that all DSOs and the TSO use to manage congestion during the um, during the w the period that the intraday market is open. And through this platform, all the uh, well, basically the imbalances that are happening are being uh, managed by having the coupling coupling with the intraday market. So now at this moment, we are managing around 100 contracts with customers. Um, uh, These uh, two types of contracts for different type of um, congestion problems that we have in our grid, but our goal is to scale this to thousands, uh, to the number of thousands, not just because we want to, but because also we have the need to do so. And in the moment, uh, the well, I think all the contracts that we have are for congestions that are happening on substation level, high voltage to medium voltage, but that's not the only place where we have uh, problems. Actually, we also have problems in the medium voltage network, and in order to scale, we also want to have products there. Uh, and here is where network calculations are necessary and where we use the power grid model. And finally, in the future, we would also like to be able to offer products in the low voltage network. They may be different types of products, but in any case, we need to be able to uh, evaluate the situation uh, also in the low voltage network. And of course, the further we go, the lower we go, let's say, in the, in the voltage level, the less measurements we have, uh, and it gets more tricky to, uh, to evaluate um, the situation there. So going back to the HAS structure, uh, we have two parts. We have the state estimator and, um, and the dynamic safety uh, assessment. And we have the power grid analyzer as a component who uh, handles both uh, in a way. So it's, um, the power grid analyzer is a product that is developed by my team. And it's a part of us who interacts with the other uh, parts of the system. And basically, it supports the uh, two calculations provided uh, by the power grid model, so power flow and state estimation. So we use the power grid model to do the calculations, and for the structure of the data that we uh, that we use, uh, we use the common information model. Um, uh, and yeah, on the right hand side, you can see how the how the API uh, looks like. So as I mentioned, we have these two calculations. So what, the, what are the use cases uh, that, that we use it? So mostly now we focus on doing calculations in the medium voltage network. So our goal with the state estimation is to gain insight in the network because we don't have measurements everywhere. So we also use 
measurements and pseudo measurements when measurements are not available in order to gain insight in the network because we don't we haven't monitored the networks with such uh, granularity and uh, monitoring them in this way also enables us to to get uh, insights on how the assets are being used whether there is uh, where, where there is uh, more room where the, where the, where the congestions are actually happening and when it comes to the power flow as our calculation, we also use it to see, okay, what will happen in the near future. So, okay, if we have uh, a, f a, f a forecast for the near future for the customers, how, how is that gonna be reflected in the grids? Do we need to take some actions? Do we need to use some products? Do we need uh, customer products, technical products, etc.? cetera? Um, so now I'll explain a bit the workflow, how it, uh, how power, the power grid model is integrated within the power grid uh, analyzer. Um, so everything starts with a requ request, so a package that contains uh, for a specific calculation that, that we want to do. It contains all the topology that is uh, needed, all the measurements, what do we want to calculate expressed in a steady state hypothesis. This is a standard format according to the, to the SIM. Uh, and then we use an in, uh, internal SIM to power grid model conver conversion uh, because of uh, our application of the SIM that is from a bit Aleander uh, specific or system operation specifics specific and then we get the data in the standard power grid uh, model format. Then we do a calculation, it can be a power flow state estimation for one time interval for a longer time period depending of how it was defined in the SIM request, and then we get the result in the in the power grid model format. And of course, the final step is to convert it back to a SIM format, forward it to another component, and then the process continues in Haas. Um, one example that uh, that I'm going to show is uh, how we, we are monitoring one one feeder, one medium voltage feeder. It's a relatively small one, but it's important because it has measurements on all all the customers there. We have some larger customers as well as medium voltage to low voltage transformers and we're able to process this data uh, as it comes of within 15 or even I think five uh, five minute intervals we can we can do uh, new uh, new calculations so uh, here it's also important and if we do this for when we consider the the size of the distribution networks it's very important that we have tools that are able to do these calculations uh, quite f quite fast. Uh, this is how the topology of that uh, feeder looks uh, in SIM. And here on the next uh, slide, you have some uh, the estimated, uh, the state estimated voltage and the apparent power for different uh, customers, um, for, for the different connection points in that uh, medium voltage network. Of course, there are still a lot of challenges that we are, uh, with that we are facing and trying to solve within the company or uh, together with, uh, with the developers of the power grid model. So for example, often availability of measurement data and information is a bit tricky. Uh, so not always we have uh, measurements, so then we have to use uh, pseudo measurements and then the quality of these pseudo measurements is important. Um, uh, then, uh, yes, the, for example, sometimes we don't know the top positions of the transformers, which may lead to, for example, as you can see on the lower figure, there is some um, really s fixed difference between the estimated and uh, the measured voltage, and in some places not. Uh, then um, if we, in the field, we have different measure measuring devices deployed over different times, not always we know the accuracy uh, correctly, so then when we do state estimation, this also influences our, our results. But there are also a lot of developments in the power grid model that help us um, deal with these issues. So for example, um, the fact that we can, uh, if we have, for example, active power measurements, but we don't have the reactive power measurements, then we can assign different uncertainty to these uh, two measurements and then help us get more accurate results. Um, also having the newton uh, raphson state estimation uh, helps with, uh, with our calculations and other different things that um, are available. Um, then, um, as already mentioned, we use a forecast, we use pseudo measurements, and of course the accuracy of this, uh, of this influences the results. So, um, 
this is of course not related to the power grid model, but within our department in general, in our company, because we use inputs from different teams from uh, different departments in the company, we're actively working on improving the forecasting that we're doing, improving the, um, uh, the, the estimations that, that, that we have for different, uh, for different profiles, and also in the end also increase uh, the, um, the measurement coverage that we have in our network. So trying to identify in which locations in the network we should place measurements in such a way that um, our uncertainty is reduced uh, the most. Um, finally, a bit uh, looking into, well, as, as a next step, now we're focusing mostly on how the networks are operated as normal, but also there are a lot of maintenance actions that are taking place in the grids due to which the networks are reconfigured as well as uh, faults are happening, which also lead to reconfigurations in the network, and that will ultimately also affect uh, how how we do congestion management and how uh, how we call uh, products from customers. And to investigate a bit more in that, we have a master thesis project uh, together with TU Eindhoven, in which we are looking into uh, wh what will the effect of this be for uh, for our processes in uh, for congestion management. Uh, so to conclude, uh, in system operations, we are building a system to actively monitor and manage the capacity of the um, distribution network. And indeed, uh, op open source um, calculation tools, which are powerful and fast, such as the Power Grid model, really help us um, achieve this. So thank you for your attention. This was my presentation. If you have uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions here? Yes. Hello, Elena. I'm Zito. So I have a question regarding your flow chart about the gas product. Could you please go back okay. to that slide? Yes, super. So for the first block, creating integral uh, integral view and your state estimation and short-term forecast. So according to your breakdown um, about difference between flow analysis and status estimation, does mean that the second block is about power flow anal um, analysis? Yes. Okay, I cool. would say so, yes. Yeah, uh, there are also other processes that happen within dynamic security assessment, but uh, the power flow analysis is kind of under it, so it's one part of other processes that happen there as well. Yeah, got it. Uh, second question is about, uh, you said your goal is to offer real-time analysis for flexibility. I just wonder for now that what's the timeline and how in advance you can offer the analysis to your cl clients? Uh, so most of the products um, that we have, are, well, it depends, to the, the, I would say that there are two parts of this question, how fast we can do the calculations, mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, how, what is the time frame of the products that we use? And for example, for the capacity limiting contract, it is um, day before, um, 8 a.m. So we do basically the analysis, I would say even two, basically two days before it happens. And for the um, uh, redispatch contracts, it's, it's also uh, a day before. I'm not sure how, uh, at which exact times uh, this is being offered, but this can be offered up until or request up until one hour before the time. Uh, but we can do the calculations much faster, and of course it makes sense to do them if new information is coming. So if we have updates in forecast, updates in measurement, then it makes sense to kind of trigger a new calculation and get a new, um, new analysis of the situation. And I think now we are able to do it at every five minutes. And I don't know if there are plans to scale to have faster, but I think even for, well, let's say for these time frames of the products, five minutes is more than enough, and future will tell if we need to go more granular. Yeah, understand. Thank you very much. Nice presentation, my Thank compliment. You. Thank you. I understand there is an online question. Hi. Um, we have two online questions by the same person that are very closely connected. Um, for the state estimation, in addition to the missing measurements, how is the topology change, uh, or how are topology changes incorporated 
For example, a switching event that changes the network, is that updated again in the sim? Um, yes, yeah, so the, um, in principle, yes, and that's the idea with, um, we're only able to monitor routes for which that we kind of get this updated. Of course, if it happens that we don't get an update, and then, so then let's say we have wrong topology, it will very likely influence the results of the calculation. So for now, we're not uh, dealing with, we, we don't have processes in place to analyze whether the topology is incorrect. And I would say that probably that will be a next step that we, we have to develop to basically also in a way validate or check whether the topology is correct if we uh, don't have accurate uh, results from the calculation. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, I cannot say that I, uh, <laughs> whether that answers the question, so I'll wait for online. Uh, the other question is, uh, for low voltage state estimation, what is the level of certainty about the network topology? That is probably very related to that. Uh, yes, so uh, in my team we're not looking into it, so my answer, my knowledge about answering this question is uh, limited, uh, but um, I would say there, that there the uncertainty is much larger than, from in, than in the medium voltage network. So uh, let's say even if we have more accurate knowledge of the top actual topology in the medium voltage network, if we move to doing calculations in the low voltage network, there probably we will run into issues about uh, accurate topology because there also the topology does not change so much. Um, and it's also very prone to having some mistakes at some point that some changes were made but not registered in the systems. So then they're in invisible for us until we get some unreasonable results in the calculations and then we wonder, okay, it's, is it a calculation problem or something is wrong in our input data? Thanks for the presentation, amazing. I have two questions, maybe a little bit detail. So for example, in this slide, uh, you mentioned short-term forecaster. Could I ask what exactly do you forecast and how you int uh, include it, integrate it into the state estimation? Uh, so the sh uh, we don't integrate it uh, with the state estimation, th but well, you could. So basically the short-term forecaster is another open source uh, project by Aleander. It's called Open Step, so open short-term energy forecasting. So you can f also find it on the Linux Energy Foundation website. And uh, well, there are many different things that are being forecasted, uh, let's say using this, the, the model from the open step. So both um, uh, uh, s uh, power at uh, substations for large customers or weather is being forecasted. So there are different things that are being uh, forecasted there. It's, this part is developed by, uh, by another team. But basically, the um, um, results from the forecasting can be used for, for, for a power flow, so for the near future, but uh, they could also be used in, for example, in state estimation. Thank you. Uh, my another question is in one slide, you mentioned currently Aliana is more towards middle voltage to uh, products, but in the future, maybe yep. uh, explore more low, volta uh, low voltage products. Could I know a little bit? Like, what's your or Alana's plan in the design of low voltage products in the future? Um, well, I'm not really involved in the design, so I cannot really comment on that. And I would say that's also not something that our company can do ourselves, but it's more about how nationally this will be uh, done, uh, also decided by other DSOs and uh, the regulator ACM. So. Uh, I don't know if at this moment there are any proposals for products in the low voltage network. I believe not, but I'm not 100% per sure. Or maybe the new changes in the network code don't really specify if a product can be, so it's not excluded they can be offered in the low voltage network. Uh, so that's one part, whether there are some specific products designed there. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I don't know, but then also of course uh, for e even if there is a plan, then implementing that, being able to offer even the same type of product at high voltage, medium voltage, and low voltage, it bec becomes more difficult as we go um, to the lower voltages of the network, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? 
Then again for my time for the trick questions. Mm -hmm. So in, in the daily deployment of Power Query Analyzer, what is the most uh, pain point that uh, we we seen always seen? Oh, that's failed again. And uh, the annoying point there. Um, hmm, I have to think uh, a bit about this because I am I'm not I'm luckily not dealing with the issues in deployment. I'm more before that when we are developing. Uh, but uh, uh, I would say when uh, when the well basically when the calculation is failing and then okay figuring out why and I think mostly it's because there is some missing data or something has gone wrong with the input data. That's the pain point. Thank you. I think there were another two online questions which are were answered by you, but uh, maybe we it's better also to spread out for the audience here. Um, so the questions were about uh, where is the uh, API that you are using, and it is uh, not open for the public. <laughs> um, the reason for that is that uh, uh, it deals specifically with uh, the Aliander's uh, grid, so it is not generic enough to be open source. It's um, even if it may be useful, it'll probably take a significant amount of effort to make it useful. <laughs> and the other question was about uh, the SIM to PGM conversion. Um, the one you use is also for the very same reason, not open source. Um, however, uh, I think a year ago, uh, a presentation was given by uh, one of our Italian friends uh, in the Power Grid Model Meetup about uh, another open source uh, a repository within the Power Grid Model organization that does sim to pgm conversions. It is in beta, it is op optimi uh, optimized for the Italian grid, but if you are uh, dealing with sim to Power Grid Model uh, conversions, it might be useful to take some inspiration from that. Hope that answers all the questions. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, uh, I would like to thank you for thank Irena you. for your presentation. You. Well, so, welcome back. So we'll come back. Uh, we'll continue with another interesting presentation from our colleagues from Annexis, Theo Niels Dirks, uh, on his master project about uh, optimizing reactive power flow in the medium voltage networks. So, floor is yours. Okay. Look at this. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody, and uh, thanks for the invitation. So, as said, I'm Niels Dirks. Currently working uh, at Enexis, but uh, in February I graduated on uh, this subject uh, at the yeah, Eindhoven University of Technology. And so uh, I was invited to do uh, the presentation about this uh, subject. Uh, and as said, I'm currently working at, uh, as a network architect um, at Enexis. Uh, so I stuck at Enexis where I conducted uh, this uh, thesis. So. I can use this one as well. First of all, I will uh, introduce the, the subject, the, the, the topic of reactive power. Uh, I will introduce uh, the research question. I will uh, talk about um, how I uh, conducted my research. I will show some results if time uh, allowed it. I think it's not that uh, uh, important for you. I will dive a bit deeper into the methods uh, where I used power grid model. That's um, most interesting for you, I guess. Uh, and I will conclude and you may ask some questions. So to me, the, the topic of reactive power was introduced uh, with the beer analogy. Um, so I will introduce it to you as well. We have the active power, which makes light, uh, makes heat, uh, does all the useful stuff. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, you can see this as the yellow uh, liquid of the beer. And then we have Another thing, and that's the reactive power, uh, which is used in the network to 
build and maintain the electric and magnetic field uh, in the grid, which are then able to transport uh, active power. So um, uh, there are three main components in, in the grid. So we have the resistor, which only uses uh, uh, active power. And then we have a capacitor, um, which uh, uh, produces only reactive power. We have an uh, uh, inductor, which only uh, consumes uh, reactive power. And those three make up the grid. So when we, when we lay a cable into the ground, it acts mostly as a capacitor when it's not loaded. So it's generating reactive power. And when it's um, loaded, it's it, 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 it uh, transports a current and then it becomes more inductive. It can still be capacitive, but, but it becomes more um, inductive, for example. And if you have a, a heat pump at home, for example, uh, which has a pump directly connected to uh, the, the 230 volts, uh, this acts as, a, as an yeah, inductor. It's a motor, just a, uh, yeah, a, a just an inductor. Uh, washing machine is a good example as well. So now we have the electricity grid. And the medium voltage network is operated by the DSO, the distribution grid operator. Um, and that's uh, on the voltage levels of about 10, 20 kilovolts, uh, as well as the low voltage part, uh, which I will not uh, dive into today. And then there is one interesting point, and that's the, the, the interchange between the TSO tenant in the Netherlands and the DSO uh, in Access, for example. Um, that is important because that's the, um, the point of exchange uh, where I'm going to talk about today of reactive power. Now, in the past, we have seen that uh, distribution grid operate operators mostly consumed reactive power. So the, the grid, the distribution grid, was mostly inductive, so to say. However, in the last few years, this has dis de dis decreased, as you can see in the graph. Uh, so in, in recent years, even the distribution grid operators um, delivered reactive power back to, uh, to tenants. And this is mostly due to cabling, so underground cables, which are capacitive. Um, um, yeah, as, uh, as said, we, we, we have the energy transition, so we have to lay uh, a lot of cables into the ground. But also uh, the use of power electronics uh, in, in households, for example, um, are less inductive than they used to be, or uh, even capacitive. Um, and also renewable energy, heat pumps, uh, solar inverters are all yeah, capacitive of nature. Uh, and this all adds up to a decreasing, decreasing trend of um, consuming reactive power. Now, this causes some problems uh, with voltage mainta maintenance um, at, at Tenet, for example. Um, and in this graph, you can see the, the used means to cope with those uh, uh, voltage uh, rises. Now, Tenet uses reactors uh, most of the time to, to consume reactive power, but also it, uh, it, it, it asks its uh, customers to, um, to allow their generators to consume reactive power, for example, but in yeah, more than 20% of the time, they have to switch off cabled circuits, uh, which produce reactive power, to, um, yeah, to, to cope with the large amount of re reactive power that is in excess uh, in the grid to maintain voltage uh, levels within the limits. Now, there is a Dutch electricity grid code. And specifically for reactive power, we have this graph here. Now, when, um, when, when the active power P is positive, it means that the DSO in Nexus, for example, is uh, consuming active power from TSO tenant. Same holds for uh, negative. There it is delivering active power to tenant. And the same holds for Q. When it is positive, it is consuming reactive power, so it is 
inductive load. Um, and when it's negative, um, yeah, it's delivering back. So the electricity grid code says, okay, the, the grid, uh, the DSO grid can be inductive to 48% of the uh, capacity of a substation. Uh, however, it may, it may not um, um, generate reactive power that much back to our grid. And now I have plotted a measurement. Every black dot is a, a quarter of an hour of a measurement um, in our grid. And here you can see that when, um, yeah, it, 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 it actually is below the red limit. It, it delivers more reactive power back to tenant, and that causes some problems for tenant, of course. Now, what I tried is to optimize the uh, reactive power flow in the network to yeah, minimize costs while complying with the grid code and staying within voltage and capacity limits. How did I do this? I made a, uh, yeah, a small medium voltage grid with uh, the external TSO grid, a transformer, uh, two main buses B2 and B3, connected with some cables C1 to C3, and uh, some load at the buses and every black um, square represents a customer, for example, which has a load or uh, a generator. Can be a PV plant, can be a uh, wind park, for example. Now what I did to, um, to represent an inductor bank or a capacitor bank at, uh, which can be placed at buses from um, yeah, a nexus, this can be done by the DSO itself, is uh, placing an inductor or a capacitor to, to represent consuming or producing reactive power at that bus. I implemented that in the model. Now, I also used the generators of customers um, to be able to control reactive power as well. So um, G1 to G3 um, are yeah, are used to, to control reactive power in the grid. Now I have the following um, yeah, flow diagram where um, yeah, one of the, 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 main, the, the main optimization is done by differential evolution. I will not uh, yeah, bother you too much with this, so I will, uh, yeah, let me skip this. Um, but I first start with a quarter of measurements. Every, um, yeah, every quarter of an hour, there are measurements done in the grid, um, and that is used in the model. It's inputted in the model. So at every node, I take a, a P measurement, and that is yeah, set at as, as, as true for that uh, quarter of an hour. Then the grid is loaded into a power grid model, and it gets optimized by changing uh, the Q set points for example, for the, the inductor bank, capacitor bank, or the Q set point for the customers, so that yeah, all requirements are set. Now, I used this um, optimization uh, formula, where I first, uh, I, I minimize the costs that, um, that, uh, that uh, DSO has to make. So first of all, uh, the first costs are for um, inductor banks specifically. Um, um, so, the, so the quarterly cost of an inductor bank is added to the formula. Then the second term um, is the cost of, an oh I actually have this in slide, um, is a cost for the customer compensation. So what does the DSO have to pay a customer to control reactive power? And then of course uh, some, some losses uh, are included as well because yeah, reactive power dispatch induces some uh, currents into the grid, and it may as well work uh, beneficial to the DSO, but also uh, against it. So costs for losses are also paid by the DSO, and this must be included here. Now, there are four constraints. So the reactive power that is um, used as a set point must be it, the, 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 the generator or the inductor bank must be able to deliver it or um, yeah, or, or use it, of course. Um, then what I showed you with the, the, the green-orange graph, um, 
at the TSO-DSO interface, it has to be within its limits. Um, all nodes have to be within voltage limits. And of course, the transformer cables and devices have some capacity limits, which must be met as well. Now the optimization is done. And first of all, um, yeah, I have the vision model which I showed, and that is converted to a power grid model using the power grid model I.O. module. So that's um, yeah, firstly done at the start of the optimization. Then the, fir then the zeroth genera generation is uh, generated by, um, 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 ah, I, uh, so I said I, I first create the DSO uh, devices, so the inductor bank, for example. Um, that is what I do in, in, in code. So I first implement the vision model, and then I add yeah, inductor banks to two main buses. So I have that in my model, so I can use them. And of course, the customer generators are already there. I then set the, 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 the P measurement, the active power measurement of those devices. I set those, and I keep the, the, the Q set point of those devices, I keep those open. So I can, every iteration, I can change them and yeah, calculate the total costs with the formula I, I used. So actually, you can see here, um, the vectors I use. So in this um, example, I have device one and device two. And of those devices, you see on the axis um, the, the, the Q set point. So the reactive power set point you can see there. And every vector, um, the, the, yeah, the feasibility and the total cost of those is calculated by doing a um, um, power flow calculation using power grid model. And there you can see that in this case, specific case, device one um, actually delivers reactive power, 10 megavars, and device two does nothing. Um, and yeah, of course this can be done for every point uh, in this graph. And for this specific, specific example, I um, I plotted all points, but of course you can imagine that if I have a lot of customers, I want to reduce the amount of points yeah, that, I, that I calculate. Um, that's an option you can set in the optimization. Um, and then, um, yeah, iterations are done. Every point is updated and they all converge to one point that is optimal, so to say. So, how are those points converging to one point? I take every vector, I mutate those given a certain formula. There is done a crossover, so the parameters of those vectors are yeah, can be um, given over from parent to child, so to say. Then I do a power flow calculation, a load flow calculation with power grid model again, and then I compare the parent and the child factor, and if the child has a bet better um, cost uh, function or a, uh, is, feasible, is feasible and the parent was not, it replaces the parent in the generation, and so for every point I do this and I get a new population. And I do this up and until the, yeah, all the points converge. Now, how, do how does this look like in real life? So I have a lot of points still with the same two devices I had. And now yeah, the, the, the blue square in the left bottom corner converts yeah, to that point. So that point is, according to the um, um, optimization, the best. And in this case, it's at 0, 0.0. So um, no devices do anything. It's just uh, the grid is already optimal. But you can imagine, as you saw with the black dots, that eventually um, yeah, the, 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 the exchange of reactive power gets too much and actions must be taken. Now, so for some results, um, 
and I will not bother you too much with this, uh, you can see that the, the program was able to move PQ points. So these black points were the original points. The, the, the optimization is able to move them out of the yeah, not allowed uh, orange square in this case. Um, and yeah, I did some uh, assumptions, um, not that important. And you can see that yeah, the original operating costs of the grid, and this, uh, the original costs are in this case only um, losses in the grid uh, that are yeah, 2,478 euros. It increases to uh, 2,565 euros. Um, and this is yeah, due to uh, compensate or, or installing um, the uh, reactive, uh, the, the, the uh, inductor bank. Yes, that's what the word I was looking for. So in, by installing an inductor bank, you are able to move those points out. And yeah, it, 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 it um, requires some costs. However, if you say that operation yeah, below the bottom line or in the yellow square is not allowed, you have to make some costs, of course. Now, if the inductor bank is already there, I simulated what would happen um, if you set the cost of those devices to zero, uh, because you can just use them. It doesn't cost you anything more to install them for a quarter and then the next quarter use them as well. Then you see that also um, other points get moved up. And you can see here, uh, it's still moved out of the orange area, but also the points here are moved up because in this case, also the um, capacitive, uh, the yeah, capacitive reactive power production of the cable is compensated by consuming reactive power at the bus to uh, decrease the current in the cable and thus losses. And also with customers, you can do the same. So when you when you let customers um, control the active power, you can also see that points are moved up at a slightly higher cost, but that is yeah, just the assumption I made. I charged uh, 10 euros per megawatt hour to the customer, or the customer gets paid that. Um, you can say, you can do the same optimization with zero euros per megawatt hour, and then you can also see that customers are able to um, both um, consume reactive power and produce reactive power. So the, the voltage in the grid gets higher when they produce reactive power and just yeah, rise the voltage and thus um, network losses are reduced and thus costs are decreased. I will skip this one. So what does this mean in practice? Um, for the DSO, they have to measure uh, at the interface with the TSO, the, the exchange of reactive power and um, yeah, act on that value. They, it also requires some measurements in the grid, and of course this can be done with um, um, uh, state estimation, for example, and a couple of measurements. Um, and of course we have to look at society's best solution. So we can do this for every substation, but it may also be better to uh, install, for example, one large inductor bank at one main substation um, and, and, and use that inductor bank to um, compensate the reactive power production of, yeah, of a couple of substations, for example. Now, in conclusion to the research question, it is possible to use DSO on devices, so, so placing inductor banks. It is also possible to use customer generations, um, but further research and pricing, customer compensation um, is, is, is needed to yeah, say a final word about this topic. Um, but what must be said is that the Q exchange trend is further decreasing, of course, as we are installing more and more cables. Now, one slide uh, for my boss. Um, 
I, I stuck uh, at the Nexus, yeah, because I very much liked it. And if you would like to work on, on such a topic as well um, and, and do something with Power Grid model, for example, you can go to werken by Inexus, uh, werken by punt Inexus punt nl, and yeah, maybe you will be uh, my next colleague. So <laughs> now I will leave some time for you uh, to ask some questions. Very interesting presentation, thank you. I hope it was uh, understandable with the <laughs> questions. Um, I have two questions. First question is, uh, do they also have reactive power in uh, England because the beer has no... Uh <laughs> Yeah, I, I I know uh, from 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 research that this this problem also arose in uh, in England as well. Indeed, yeah, yeah, there are multiple uh, yeah multiple um, countries that have the same problem. But indeed, uh, yeah. they also have reactive power. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was more a joke yeah. question. <laughs> My second question is, uh, what made you choose a power grid model? Uh, to choose for power grid model to use in your research? Um, well, I I did my uh, internship at Ali uh, Aliander, and there I used Panda Power, um, and I was also yeah noted to do to do to this project uh, Power Grid model, uh, and I fast yeah, learned that this was way faster than than Panda Power for example, um, and that was actually the reason that I uh, used it. If if I would have used uh, yeah, it's not too uh, yeah, discretize. Uh, uh Panda power, of course, but uh, if I would have used it, um, it would have taken yeah, a lot of time for me to do all the optimization uh, yeah, in my computer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, have um, uh, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. So in 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 your uh, optimization problem, you didn't. Did you? Prefix the like like the uh, like the location and the capacity of the inductor and inductor banks. Yeah, I, I I indeed fixed the location because um, as a DSO you have some um, uh, in in the medium voltage grid you have some substations uh, where it would be yeah, op optimal to place such an inductor bank of course um, and and the size I fixed as well to uh, yeah, such a high value. Um, th that the optimization w w yeah, would be able to use the full range of that inductor bank. But of course, uh, this can also be used to, to, to decide on the size of the inductor bank uh, DSO uh, would be able to place. Because yeah, you, can, you can see um, what is the highest value that would be used uh, when controlling reactive power, for example. Yeah, that was sort of my uh, the question uh, that I actually want to ask. Uh, that uh, can you like based on your current like framework of optimization, and your uh, uh, can you actually also optimize the location and the let's say the capacity of those uh, inductor banks? Maybe also then like have some extra constraints, for example. For example, like you said, like maybe in practice the practical re like solution may be one big inductor bank in, the in, in one central location. And maybe like, do you think it's possible to add on top of that? Yeah, uh, you you can of course um, place inductor banks at every bus, for example, and do the and, and run the optimization, and then you will see um, uh, which location the optimization picks um, for reactive power control, and that would be the yeah, optimal location to place such an inductor bank. Um, but what you see is that the 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 impact on location. Uh, is not that high. The, the the only implication of location um, is the reduction of grid losses, for example, uh, and that costs are not that high as compared to placing, installing, buying an inductor bank. Um, yeah, so you see that if you if you buy one large inductor bank to compensate for the whole area, for example, um, it, it, it it's better to place it at the main. Um, location than placing a lot of small reactor banks um, throughout the whole grid, for example. Yeah. I understand there are several online questions. 
the first question is, uh, I understand the power grid model is useful for the power flow part, but how is vision network analyzer used? And does the PGM provide something that vision doesn't? It is just a, a, a SCADA. Yes, fa very good uh, question, and I didn't uh, introduce uh, that part, uh, I realize now. Uh, well, vision is used um, at, at a nexus to, um, to, to do power flow calculations actually for the, for, for the, for the grid, um, and that is still used today for, for um, analyzing grids. Um, so I use that as a tool to build the medium voltage network and then convert it to power grid model uh, to, 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 to do calculations with power grid model. And um, yeah, the, the, the goal actually was to um, directly use a grid of a nexus, for example, uh, to do the power flow calculations. Uh, and that would be possible, of course, uh, using an existing grid, uh, which was already available in vision. So that's where the vision uh, comes in. Um, another question is, this was fascinating, thank you so much. Do you have a paper on this that we can read through? I do, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's available at the theory library, but uh, you can, yeah, maybe you can contact me uh, through, uh, through Tony, for example, or through the LF organization, and then uh, yeah, I will be happy to uh, share it with you. Yeah. And the final one is, how did you assign tap changes for convergence in DE? Are they on automatic? Uh, I did not, so that's uh, yeah. That was uh, one of the yeah, improvements that can be made, of course. That's uh, including uh, tap changers. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, also a very good uh, remark because it can also be that uh, when regulating voltage uh, with uh, reactive power, it can be yeah, uh, counterintuitive to what a tap changer does, of course. But yeah, v yeah very good question. I did not. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I had a question about the uh, example you showed us. It was a really small network. It had two bus bars and uh, three generators. Uh, did you also uh, look at uh, larger networks and uh, how the solutions converge in the those scenarios and how stable that is? Yeah, yeah. So I I tried this on 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 some larger uh, networks as well, and. Um, yeah, the power flow calculations, th th those are done by a uh, power grid model and uh, yeah, just using the newton Repson uh, method and yeah, they will converge and it's pretty fast, uh, so to say, uh, where things get slow and that may have to do with my uh, lack of programming uh, skills as well, um, is that when you use a lot of customer nodes, so a lot of inputs for the uh, optimization, Q set points for the optimization, things get slow. But when you limit, uh, when you take a large grid um, and limit the, the, the settings to uh, just two uh, inductor banks, for example, uh, things are still uh, fast and converge fast. Um, and yeah, we are able to yeah, do calculations on large grid as well. The only limitation here is when a lot of uh, customers are used for reactive uh, power uh, control. Yeah. Do I have more questions? Do we have more questions? If then, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Very inspiring. And let's move on to the next. Thank, thank you. you very much. No trick questions. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So we have uh, watched the three. Hello. We have watched the three interesting presentations, and now it's our own show time. So we're going to them uh, sh put a lot of showcase on what we have done in the past half year, and also try to look forward. And I would like to give the floor to our development lead, Peter Salamink. Yes, thank you, Tony. How's everyone? Still energized? Yeah, well, don't worry, we're almost done. Uh, I just take a couple of minutes, roughly 50. Um, 
but then we'll have drinks afterwards and snacks um, and we can do some networking. So uh, bear with me for the coming minutes. Let me introduce myself first. Um, my name is Peter. I'm a development lead uh, of the team that of uh, Power Grid Model Maintainers. Uh, scientific software engineer at Aliander. Uh, and since this year, I'm also a guest lecturer here at this university, where I give a course to uh, together with Tony uh, that we developed this year uh, to teach students about power system simulation. And of course, they also learn how to use Power Grid model. Some practical info about Power Grid model. So it's not, well, we, we, we developed it uh, within Aliander uh, and then we gave it to, to LF Energy. So the project is not from Aliander anymore. It is from, uh, from LF Energy. So we have a technical steering committee with Tony as a chair uh, and Werner and Jonas are both in the room as well uh, and myself. Uh, so we, we steer the project uh, and then we have a team of maintainers uh, who are sitting behind the laptops or, or behind the camera. And uh, when they're usually they are not doing that, they are actively uh, coding on Power Grid model. And then of course we have uh, a lot of other developers and contributors that, uh, that contribute to our project. So we are open source. So we have a community driven development cycle. Uh, we have the meetup, which is today. It happens every half a year. Now we gather input, which I'm going to do uh, in a couple of minutes for uh, what features you would like us to develop or maybe develop yourself. Uh, so we get a clear overview and then we make a roadmap for the next half year. Um, and then there will be some development for the coming half year. We'll get feedback from you, do some improvements. And then we're at the next meetup, half a year from now, and then we do the same thing again. So first I would like to talk about some highlights of the past half year. Here it's actually right, it's Q1, Q2, 24, not Q3 and 4 of, uh, of 23. Um, we did a lot of things, I'm not going to mention them all, just some highlights. And I would like to start with uh, release 1.7, which was Newton Repson state estimation. Uh, which we released this year. So it's a new state estimation algorithm. You can uh, use it by calling the calculate state estimation function um, with the calculation method newton repson So that's really self-explanatory. Uh, but what's different from the, from the other um, state estimation algorithm that we already had is that newton repson state estimation considers all measurements to be independent real measurements. So um, that's really useful for, for a DSO, for instance, because um, if you noticed it correctly in the presentation of Irena, uh, she also mentioned that we don't have Q measurements, for instance. So it would be really odd to give the Q measurements the same weight uh, as the P measurements, which are ac actually measured. Um, so with Newton Repson, you can give them a, a different weight uh, and that will improve your, your calculation uh, performance. And if you want to know more, then you can go to our documentation um, or contact any of us because we're always happy to, uh, to help. Next one, automatic tab changing algorithm. This is a highly requested feature also by some people here in the room. Um, and I'm really happy to share that it, it's almost done. So we actually released it uh, as an experimental feature and the, the actual release is coming in the, in the coming weeks. So if you want to try it out already, then you, can, uh, you have to do one additional step from what you're used to. So from Power Grid model, you can import uh, an additional enum, experimental features, and you can uh, make uh, a class um, that is derived from the power grid model class and calls the underscore calculate power flow function instead of the calculate power flow function uh, with the experimental features enabled. That opens up some functionalities that are not opened up to the, to the regular users. So um, 
Well, documentation is also already present on how to use the, the automatic tab changer. But if you want to use it for now, do it this way. Uh, and if you can wait a couple of weeks, then we'll actually have release 1.8 ready for you. Then this year we also, uh, well, we have, we have a workshop repository on GitHub. Uh, and we also actively give workshops to other companies or universities that want to start using Power Grid model. Um, but this year we also recorded it in a webinar studio. It's, it's available on YouTube, so you can go to this link, which is really hard to memorize, or you can just scan the QR code. Um, but if you Google Power Grid model workshop, I think there's only one hit on YouTube. So that should also be uh, not that hard to find. Um, so you can you can do it yourself. You could always do it yourself. Now you can be guided yourself. Uh, but if you want an active workshop from us, that's also possible. So let us know. We're always happy to uh, to come to uh, a company or a university to uh, to give her a, a workshop in uh, in real life. That also makes it a lot easier to ask questions. Now we're also actively working on um, on uh, on promoting Power Grid model and expanding the community. So one of the examples is that this year um, Nitish went to to the FOSDEM conference in Brussels, which is the Free Open Source Software Developers European Meeting. It's uh, a mouthful of words for just a really nice open source uh, conference. Uh, so there were a lot of open source enthusiasts in that room uh, that got introduced uh, to Power Grid model, thanks to, uh, to Nitish. Then we also have Power Grid model IO. It was already mentioned today as well by, uh, by Niels, for instance. Um, it's Power Grid model input output. So we uh, provide conversions for some, some other data models one of which is vision. Um, and we do have a, a vision Excel converter that converts the vision Excel exports. Um, and we provide yep, uh, mapping files for that. But from now on, it's also possible for users to, to make your own mapping file and load in your own uh, custom mapping file. An additional thing is that we now also support Vision 9.7, which is uh, the newest version of Vision. Um, and some things in the, in the data model changed. But we now support Vision 9.7 and also older models of Vision. Um, so you can actually map the terms uh, and the column names between different Vision versions. Uh, so if you have both versions installed on your laptop with uh, two mapping files, you can uh, can run both. So you have new class parameters. Um, so you have the source file language, depends on uh, on which language you are using Vision, Dutch or, or English. And you have uh, a mapping of the terms changed between versions, the actual mapping file and the log level that you want your uh, uh, your conversions to run. Now we also did improvements on the Newton Repson power flow. So Newton Repson power flow is one of the oldest algorithms in uh, in uh, in power grid model, but we still uh, keep on improving things. So we used to do a flat start, so set everyone to one or everything to to one per unit. Um, and right now we don't do that anymore. We use the linear power flow method where we assume all loads and generations to be of constant impedance type um, to do a first calculation and use that as the starting point for the newton repson iteration. Well, why did we do that? Um, when we started working on the automatic tap changer, we figured out that the flat start was actually not enough to converge for some cases. Um, so, uh, so we needed something better. But Next to that, the in initialization is better. Uh, it might also improve the performance uh, in some cases. Necessary condition on observability. So for state estimation, it's really important that your system is observable. 
which means that you have enough measurements and that they are installed at the right location. Um, doing a full observability check is actually quite hard and we're working really hard on the mathematics. Um, but we have done and have implemented a first step that's the necessary condition. So we have uh, it's a simple check um, that will also count the sensors and it has a, a simple location check um, to do a first check if the system is observable or not. So we'll before, if the system was not observable, you would always get a sparse matrix error, which well can be a lot of different things and it's not really clear. Right now, usually or mostly you get uh, uh, an error that's actually saying something meaningful. Not enough measurements available for state estimation, so not observable. But sometimes you still get the sparse mat matrix error because we don't do a full observability check. We can only catch the low hanging fruit in this case. Then um, we also made some improvements in exposing the power grid model error types. So previously we always had just the power grid, uh, power grid error uh, in, the, in the Python API. But right now we have some more uh, meaningful errors as well. So it's, it's, it's good to know that the base type has not changed. So if you're using the old errors to, to catch, then that would still work. Um, but if you update to the new error types, you're no longer dependent on actually checking the error message because we, we have uh, specific errors right now. So in this case, in this example, we have a node input where we initialize er an array of two nodes, um, but they both have ID zero, which is not allowed. So now we get a conflicting ID error, uh, which also mentions conflicting ID detected zero. Well, if you want to, to, uh, to catch it yourself, you can do something like on the right, try to run it, accept the conflicting ID. Well, in this case, that will be caught and it will throw uh, the, a message, duplicate IDs found. Well, if something else happens, you would still catch a power grid error. Yeah. Do you also have uh, documentation on all the different error messages or should you just inspect the code and see what where it's coming from? I, I think it's also in the documentation. Okay, yeah. great. Good question. Um, and then, well, we did a lot of things, but next to that we also did uh, a lot of internal improvements and bug fixes. Um, and also improvements in documentation. Um, so if, if, if you're trying to do something that, that I mentioned here, for instance, and you cannot find it in the documentation, please let us know in the discussion board or, uh, or the issue board, for instance, uh, because then we can update the documentation accordingly. Before we move on, uh, are there any questions about the highlights? So a question about the workshops, is that like only uh, like an introductory workshop or is there also a thing on like maybe those new experimental features or, or like the, f the new features that are introduced? Um, well, we, we try to, uh, we have a lot of examples and for a lot of new things, the examples are expanded. So for automatic tab changer, there will be another example for instance. Uh, and we have two workshops, one for power flow and one for state estimation. So if something changes in the power flow or state estimation, those workshops are extended as well. Uh, and they have assignments and, uh, and actual solution notebooks. Um, and well, for, for the rest there are examples as well, but not for everything there is an actual assignment. Any other questions before we move on? Online also not, all right. Then the data science analysis toolkit. Last, uh, last meetup, it was uh, mentioned and we had a short demo by uh, Jaap uh, Schouten and, 
and Thijs Baaien. Um, on, and oh, we had a question for you, like we're, we're using this with an Aliander, how do you feel about it? And people were actually really enthusiastic about it. So I want to let you know that we're working actively on making that open source as well. Um, when, I cannot say yet, but if you subscribe to our mailing list, you will uh, definitely be updated uh, when we're ready. But do know that we're uh, working uh, actively on that part. And then we get to the part of community decisions or, uh, or announcements. So first of which is the deprecation of Python versions. As some of you know, our long-term release strategy is to support three Python versions. Um, and then, well, in, in October, a new Python version is released, and then we're planning on dropping the older supported version in January after that. Currently, we support from Python 3.9 up, uh, meaning that we support four versions at this moment. So we're doing an accelerated uh, deprecation this year. So in July, we'll also drop 3.9, and then we'll only support 3.10, 11, and 12 from July onwards. And then from then, every January, a new Python version will be dropped. Community decisions. For the people that have attended uh, this meetup before, this is a familiar slide. Um, because we ask it every time, and well, we're still not, uh, we haven't dropped many Linux 2.24 yet. But we're asking it again. So um, currently we support many Linux 2.24, and we want to go to 2.28. And there are some users affected. So that's uh, mainly Debian 9, Ubuntu 18.04, and Amazon Linux 2. So it's good to mention that includes AWS hosted development platforms such as AppStream. Um, and we want to, to drop it. So I'll come to, uh, to that in a bit um, because we're going to ask you if we can. And we would also like your, your uh, input for uh, for new features, as mentioned, for the for the roadmap to come. So I'll switch to uh, to a Mentimeter right now. And then, if you could go to menti.com and enter that code on your phone or laptop, doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, then we have some questions for you that we would like uh, like an input on. And the first one is, do you agree to drop many Linux to 24? It's already the first note. <laughs> Let's wait uh, two more minutes to see if more uh, more answers are coming in. Maybe also from online. There are at least four no's, so that would mean that we can still not drop it. So then you'll see uh, the same question again in half a year. Would it be uh, interesting to ask uh, for how, lo how long, uh, I'm not sure who's uh, voted no, but when, uh, how long sh do you need it to keep it supported? Yeah, that's a good question. And maybe we can include that in the next question because this is uh, an open uh, open <laughs> response field. Oh great. <laughs> so, well, if you answered no, please also specify why. But as Jonas mentioned, maybe also 
specify when you expect that we could drop it, if you have any idea. And I will expect at least four answers on this uh, question. If there are any questions in between, then uh, also feel free to uh, raise your hand and, uh, and ask a question. Yeah, so I think there are still some teams at Aliana working on AppStream developing on algorithms with the Power Grid model. <coughs> uh, if they can move to like the SageMaker solution for developing this, I think that may help in accelerating this, but then maybe we should actively engage with the teams to see if they uh, agree with that. So for now, I think it's too quick to say that we can drop it, but I don't think there's not a solution if that uh, if SageMaker would uh, suffice. I think most teams are also looking at using SageMaker. Yeah, yeah. I think moving to, to SageMaker would, uh, would definitely uh, be possible for most of the teams, but let's uh, dive into that afterwards. So we only have two responses with four no's, so that's very interesting. <laughs> Is someone typing a really long uh, answer or? <laughs> I'll give you uh, one more minute to uh, to fill it in. What's also interesting is that we happen to have uh, two Linux experts here from Red Hat. <coughs> Maybe we can have some advice from those guys to see how they comment on this kind of issue. <laughs> <laughs> you have the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think no, no, no clear advice. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, let's see. I think uh, we are not so deep into into your development, so and 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 just looking at. But of course, that's uh, a common problem to 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 um, to agree on on, the st uh, on specific version and and then uh, and on the other hand to to keep advancing. And uh, and this is um, two sides of the of the same matter. Yeah. Thank you. So just out of interest, like, why are you guys motivated to drop the support because of like extra maintenance work? And also dropping the support would mean that it would, like the power grid model would not at all work on those distributions. Is that understanding correctly? I think Tony can answer this question. Uh, yes, best. Uh, the, the, that's actually something to, with to do with Red Hat actually. So, so very interesting. So we, we need to build, pre-build the, the C++ code for the Python libraries and publish it to the, to, to, to the PyPI repository. And then the, the, the how Linux, especially the glibc library works in this sense is that you have the, the, the operating system you build uh, is the minimum glibc version you need to able to run it. So the common way in the Python community is that we try to build the Python package in as old Linux distro as possible so that everything newer than that can be built. And for in this case, the, the uh, we, we now build it at, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, I think it's called Armor Linux 8, so we don't manage that. So, so Python authority, they have managed several Linux distributions to advise you to build that. And the the problem is that th if we choose an older distribution, we also have a less fancy compiler. So uh, I, I have to I do have to give compliments to compliments to Red Hat because uh, all of fancy uh, distros are made by Red Hat or, or a variation of Red Hat like uh, like uh, CentOS or the newest they use the Arm Linux. They try to migrate or backpost the latest 
or as latest as possible compiler to the older Linux distro, so you can use all these kind of new C++ features even in the old Linux, but there's, there's a limit. So we are hitting that limit now. So with some of our fancy features, we cannot use it because uh, otherwise it cannot be compiled in that old Linux version. And if we drop one of the version, that can be moved forward. An alternative could, for instance, be to version pin power kernel to the latest one that does work, and then we will keep main uh, we will keep maintaining, uh, keep developing. But then your version pins, you don't get security patches, etc. Unless in very extreme cases where it is needed. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe just a small caveat case that this only applies to the pre-built binaries in the PyPI. So let's say if we now it's supported, for example, to Ubuntu 18.4, and then if, for example, you have a Ubuntu 16.4, you want to install Power Grid model, it's to still try to install it, but then it doesn't have a pre-built binary. You will download the source file and try to compile it, but and then it will fail because uh, si Ubuntu 16.4 will not have a compiler which is have a full C++ 20 support, so you cannot build it anyway. Unless you use something from the Red Hat, they, they do have something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Tony. Also, thank you for the for the input. And uh, well, as last time, we have to discuss it uh, internally with an Aliander. And then we're just really curious for the people that are using PowerGrid model. Are you just using the Python API, or are you also using the C API? and or. We do know that most of the people are actually using the Python API. Uh, but we're trying to keep the C API really stable from now on as well. So we're just really curious if there is uh, anyone either here or, or online that, that actually uses it or not yet. I don't see new answers coming in. So, uh, well, everyone joining this meetup today at least uses the Python API. And then another question for you. It's an open question. If it were up to you, uh, how would you like to contribute in, in any possible way? If you want to contribute to an open source project, of, of course. But uh, All right, I at least see promotion, feedback, or documentation. Maybe more people are, are uh, feature requests is, uh, is popping up. And that's, that's also, uh, also what, we, what we notice at this moment that, that most of the, the contributions that we get at this moment are from feature requests, uh, documentation, feedback that we get, bug reports, um, use cases um, and validation cases that we can add in our in our uh, validation checklist um, so a code review is popping up I was going to say I don't see anyone that would actually like to contribute to the code and that's also one of the, the hmm? ah, develop new features nice 
Yeah, so we're we're also trying to grow as a as a community, and at this moment, um, well, we're we're mainly developing on on Power Grid model, but we would also like to actively support anyone that would like to contribute to to our project. So, um, is there is there anyone that filled in and and wants to contribute to the to the to the project that has a feeling that something is holding you back? Would you like to elaborate maybe on what that would be? So what, what could we do to help you to contribute to our project? Is there anything in the way? Like, well, I don't know, maybe you want to contribute to the code but you don't know C++, or f that, that, well, that could be something that's really in the way, for instance. What would be a good way to start if you want to contribute? Yeah, really good question. I am going to, to show that in one of the upcoming slides, but um, we also have a, a list of good first issues. Um, that uh, That's at least something that we think that are good, good first issues uh, that are scoped to, to a small part of the project. Uh, and that would be a really, really good start to, uh, to start diving into the code and uh, the possibility to to actively contribute. Of course, then we're we're talking about code contributions. But as mentioned before, the the feedback or bug bug reports from people that actually use it, uh, or maybe validation cases that we can add, that also helps us. It's also a bit related to that. Uh, I, I don't know what exactly is needed, for example, to, to, to contribute to the code. Uh, like, for, for example, just like, like uh, um, for example, do I need to know, do, do I need to be an expert in terms of the algorithm, for example, of the newton robson of the state estimation, or do I need to be very familiar with the C++, uh, C++ or do I need to know about Linux, or do I need to uh, know about Python and these kind of things, uh, or Maybe it's already enough. If I know some of them, then I can already contribute. Yeah, good, good question. So we, we have a tag of, uh, of good first issue, but we also have tags, for instance, C++, so that would require uh, really deep C++ knowledge, or a tag Python, so then it would just touch the Python side. Um, electrical engineering, so that could, for instance, be on the validation test cases, then you need to have electrical engineering uh, knowledge. So for, for all of the issues that are available on, on GitHub, we try to add tags um, to at least steer you in, in the direction of what, what um, knowledge is required to, uh, to be able to pick something up. What would it bring for somebody to contribute? Would it be like uh, diving into stuff, uh, getting involved with the team, learning along the way, maybe about scientific computing or the electrical engineering problems? Good question. Well, you, you, you can, uh, can contribute in, in any possible way. And if you feel like, hey, I want to contribute to, a, to an open source project because well, maybe you think it's fun, but it's also, it, it looks good on your resume, for instance, if you, if you have a lot of contributions to, to, uh, to open source projects. Um, but if you want to pick something up and don't know where to start, you can always uh, ask questions either in the discussion board or on the issue or contact us directly. And we are more than happy to help you to get started with, uh, with actively contributing. And we could actually um, have contact and, and steer you in the, in the right direction. So you could have, uh, well, you could, could work together with the team, for instance, if that would help you in the, in the right direction. Uh, the links are shared in the chat, I just heard, for the people online. And they will also pop up in the in the slides in a, in a moment. One more question. Yeah, I just have one suggestion, but I'm not sure whether it's a good idea, but I just know from like uh, Django, the framework, uh, Python framework, uh, the conference, there they have like, er, there's a yearly conference and then at some point during that conference, there's a time where people all together actively work on uh, issues and you can pick up issues while everybody is there in the room. 
So it might be an idea to maybe organize such a day or a uh, part of a day uh, every once in a while so that we can collaboratively make like a start with issues. Uh, might be an idea. Yeah, good, uh, good suggestion. Well, today we won't start actively working on issues, but we would like your input in coming issues. Um, so if you have any feature requests for the Power Grid Model project, uh, that includes Power Grid Model I.O. as well, or maybe something that's not even there yet, please uh, use a couple of minutes to uh, to mention it, because we can use that as input for uh, for our development. Share the link of the current roadmap in the, in the chat, and uh, if you open the Power Grid Model repository, you, you also see the already defined issues, so that may give you some hint. But there are quite a lot of issues online, so you, you don't need to go through all of them. You can also, if you just think, well, I, I need this, then well, just mention it. And then uh, we can do the check for you as well, if it's already an issue uh, that is known or, uh, or not yet. I guess we can take a long holiday this year. <laughs> Let's wait for a couple of minutes if people are still uh, still typing. All right, I see neutral explicit model popping up. Could someone maybe maybe elaborate what you would expect from us? Was it anyone in this room or online maybe? No, otherwise we get to the to the next one. So well, I see sim. So that's uh, uh, input output. Well, we do have a, a sim converter internally, uh, but not yet open source. Um, and that's because sim is a uh, is a common information model, but it's not not so common because it's open to your own interpretation. So every company uses it in a different way. So. The SIM conversion that we have at Aliander right now would not work at other companies. That's why it's not open source yet. So once that becomes more stable, it, it is on our roadmap to have, uh, have an open source uh, SIM conversion. A posteriori uncertainty. Anyone who would like to elaborate on uh, what you would expect from us in that case? Is there something in the chat? Tony? <coughs> Both actually came from the chat. Okay. Uh, for the uh, neural explicit model, uh, the uh, response is uh, yes, that would be that the four wires of the three phase network are modeled without assuming that the neur uh, that neutral is grounded everywhere. And okay. For the a posteriori uh, uncertainty, that is, uh, what is the uncertainty of the estimated uh, uh, powers and voltages of the state estimation? Yeah, good, good question, and definitely something interesting in in diving into. Um, let's let's do do two more before we move on, um, because I think everyone is looking forward to drinks. At least the people uh, over here. What you're doing at home, uh, I don't know. Um, 
simultaneity in the network? Anyone who would like to, uh, to elaborate on that? Yes, I'm trying to get a little bit creative, but uh, I know that we did, uh, at Alianda, did some uh, proof of concept of how to uh, input simultaneity into a load flow calculation where uh, that differs throughout the network. So uh, uh, lower in the network, you expect higher loads relatively than uh, high up in the network and how to handle that in a load flow situation. Uh, I think that might be a topic that can have high impact on the medium voltage grid calculations. Uh, and we are now, yeah, I think not uh, being able to handle optimally, but would be more uh, something to uh, experiment with or uh, uh, brainstorm on uh, in the first settings. That's not really concrete, but that's something I think we are going to work on at some teams. And that's that's mainly if you're looking, for instance, at a high load or low load scenario, then probably right. Because if you're doing profile calculations, then that's probably included in the profiles that you have in your. Uh yeah, but also if there's uncertainty in the profiles, then that would also differ throughout uh, the network how you handle yeah. that. So I think, yeah, I think it can and how that affects like voltage uh, simulation throughout the network. Uh that would be in interesting, maybe. Yeah, definitely. We can uh, definitely dive into that one. Um, and then the last one, calculation on partial network. <laughs> <laughs> okay, closer, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, at uh, in uh, a lot of projects, what we're now doing is we have uh, a network in memory and then we're uh, updating parts and uh, doing uh, uh, a copy of all the data to the power flow and then uh, do a power flow on that part of the network. Uh, maybe the interface could be more flexible that you initialize the complete topology and then uh, build like an interface to update the uh, power flow on uh, certain nodes in the network. Uh, uh, which are being uh, changed by changes in our uh, interface at the moment. At that moment, so that's now something we're filtering ourselves, um, but means we are copying a lot of data. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your your input. Uh, they were asking this question. Doesn't mean that you cannot give this information uh, during the coming half year and have to wait for the meetup. If there's anything you want from us. Let us know, open a discussion or, uh, or an issue on GitHub um, and we can see what we can do. And then I'm getting back to the slides. So then we actually com come to the closing. So, well, as, as mentioned before, it's not a uh, it, it Power Grid model is, fr is from LF Energy, so it's from the open source community. So uh, we really want a, a community-driven ecosystem. Uh, right now, uh, the main maintainers are, are all from Aliando, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, so uh, if you want to work on it with your company, be happy to do so. We can also think big. Uh, well, we have to meet up. We can organize working groups. I had some interesting topics for brainstorms, for instance. We can do hackathons, uh, which we uh, also already did uh, to make proof of concept to implement it uh, in some other projects. Um, we can do tutorials, workshops, consultancy. And that also doesn't mean that we need to be the ones giving a workshop. If you are really familiar with Power Grid model and think, hey, I see a business model here. I think I can give workshops to the company. Feel free to do so because it's open source and anyone can do with it what he wants. Um, webinars as well. So, well, just to mention that we can uh, think big and anything is possible. Communications. So we have a mailing list. So if you want to be updated on, on new features, on bug reports, uh, anything Power Grid model related, subscribe to our mailing list through LF Energy. Be aware that lfenergy.org is often caught by a spam filter. So you need to check your spam uh, every now and then 
or uh, make sure that your IT department uh, whitelists it. Um, our roadmap, the link was already shared in the chat, I think. So there you can see all open issues uh, and also what we're working on at this moment and what we will probably pick up in the, in the coming quarter. Um, and issues and discussions, so you can post uh, issues in the in the issue board of a relevant uh, repository, or at the at the Power Grid model organization itself, start a new discussion. So if you have a question for us, um, you can ask us directly, but it would be better to post it on the discussion board because then we provide the answer there as well, and then everyone else that has the same question after you uh, can see the answer as well. Then ways of contribution. Uh, we mentioned it already, um, but y there are different layers. So you can use the library, give feedback, uh, report bugs. That's already uh, giving us a lot of useful input. But you could also dive one layer deeper uh, and provide us validation test cases. Um, if you want to do more, then you could also provide the Python or, or improve the Python API if you think, hey, this function can be updated, uh, or I think we can do something better, um, then feel free to do so. And if you want to really dive into the C++ core, uh, you can, for instance, add a new algorithm or new models. Um, the list of, of good first issues is given as well. In the slide, I think it's in the chat as well. Uh, so if you want to contribute, visit that link and uh, maybe there is something nice for you. And then I would just like to say thank you for uh, for joining today and uh we're having drinks here at the uh, at the offline look or at the yeah at the offline location online i would like to thank as well uh the meeting will be closed in uh, in a couple of seconds and um well thank you all